<sighs> okay, look, it's not what you think. I am not a furry. As much as I know some of you would already like to roast me in the comments, I would ask that you withhold your judgment. Furries get a lot of hate throughout the internet, and with semi-good reason sometimes. There are plenty stories out there about how the furry community has traumatized people. Rest assured, this is a not the story of how I became a furry, but rather the story of how the furry community traumatized me. And just for the record, I am a scaly, not a furry. Give me that dragon Why, hello there. I am your bureaucratically bubbly host, Blossoming Desire, here today with something rather unusual for me. To all the diehard furries about to click off, calm down. I'm actually here today to plead your case. If you have been one of my few followers, you know that we typically talk about plants on this channel. But today I thought we would do something different and review a visual novel. Today's discussion will revolve around a finished in 2020, free-to-play sci-fi romance gay furry visual novel about Roman wolf aliens. This of course is Adastra, with my dear sweet Amicus. Don't worry, we will get to you. I will be splitting this review into two parts. We will do a mostly spoiler-free section where I define my scoring system and give out ratings. In part two, we will talk about the specifics of how this thing is almost guaranteed to make you fall in love with the absolute abomination of a dreamy sweetheart wolf boy. And yes, again, I am not a furry. But before we continue though, I want to clarify my intent and purpose of this video. My intent here is not to make fun of the furry community as funny as it is to some of you. My hope is to maybe reach beyond the very niche gay furry audience for a second here. While I doubt my channel is big enough to accomplish that, I still want to make the case that something as stupid sounding as a gay furry visual novel can still have its own artistic merits. My other hope is that this can be a reference for someone who is not part of the gay and or furry community. What I mean by that is I want to explain to the straights why your um, gay and or furry friend might happen to be completely heartbroken over a virtual wolf boy. I think this goes a bit beyond the idea that a slight bit of wholesomeness in the year of 2020 was enough to traumatize an entire group of people. So, for the general review, we will be rating on a scale of 1 to 10, with five separate categories. I think I will use this system again if we ever review another visual novel or a game that happens to have adult content. Of course, we will have an overall score. This will cover how the novel and how it works as a whole, how it becomes, or perhaps fails to become, more than the sum of its parts. This will also be where I talk about whether or not I feel comfortable recommending it, perhaps even outside its normal niche demographic. I'll put this at the end after we cover everything else. Next will be the plot. Is this thing worth reading as its own story rather than just a vehicle for adult content and or fan service? The third category will be characters. No visual novel is complete without good characters and character motivation after all. The fourth category is of course adult content. I was originally thinking of calling this section something else, but I'm going to at least make a half-hearted attempt to um keep this video and this channel from getting age restricted. Possibly easier said than done considering the subject matter. Here I'm just going to go over the basics of what is there and talk about how smoothly the adult content is integrated into the rest of the game. Basically we are talking about how cringy, awkward, and or out of place the content is and not delving into deeply subjective and personal ideas like hotness. 
keep in mind the score does not directly correlate to the amount of adult content in a given story. It just it's just about how said content manages to be pulled off. The final category will be choices and gameplay. For a visual novel, this is about how player choices affect the story. Of course, this section will be more about gameplay for more involved visual novels and or games. So let's begin, shall we? Plot, 10 out of 10. To give a basic synopsis without spoiling too much, our main character is accidentally kidnapped by Roman wolf aliens. In order to get home, he has to ensure that the proper emperor ends up on the throne of the Roman wolf empire. Of course, as you can imagine, a Roman succession crisis is a natural ground for plenty of political intrigue and keeps the stakes high throughout the story. This is a very well-written plot that keeps you on your toes up until the resolution of the climax and perhaps even into the epilogue. There are some very clever bits of foreshadowing and subversion that we will cover in the spoiler section of the review. While it earns a perfect score, it still does have some small continuity errors and plot holes. I was originally going to give the plot a 9.5 due to these errors, but ultimately they don't really affect too much. And, well, let's be honest, I don't want to be petty like that. This is definitely something that is worth reading for its narrative. Characters, 8 out of 10. Overall, the characters are rather well-developed. The main character and the love interest do have a very satisfying arc, while still managing to be somewhat believable. A lot of the characters have very well-fleshed-out motivations and internal lives, and become very empathetic towards the end of the novel. The character designs are, for the most part, typical furry, but there are a few interesting things about them. For example, Amicus has kind of a strongman physique, whereas Neferu has the more traditional bodybuilder physique. I'm highlighting this because the difference between the two is actually used in the novel, which is interesting when it comes to typical character design. Typically, we associate bodybuilder physiques with strength, and while a bodybuilder is certainly stronger than your average person, the physique as a whole tends to be a lot more form over function. Again, I don't want to spoil too much, but form over function and function over form describe these two characters perfectly. There is even a little bit to Kato's character design that we'll touch on later. To end this section, I will say that my one criticism is that a few of the backstories could have been more fleshed out, but at the same time, there's actually a sequel in development called Chemia that might end up addressing my concerns. Adult content. 9 out of 10. So I need to start this section by saying adult content is not really the point of this game. While there are only like two to four main scenes, depending on exactly what you count. I have to give it a high score though because what is there is very well integrated and or justified. There are also a bit of mild bits of nudity here and there, but I don't think it quite counts as blatant fan service. Regarding this, there are actually a few interesting purposes for the nudity, namely highlighting cultural differences within the world of the novel. There is, of course, fan service here and there, but all the most romantic stories have to find some way or another to develop the romantic tension between the characters. What I do want to note regarding the fan service is that it's much less awkward and much more, let's just say, consensual than most romance stories. This is actually a bit of a breath of fresh air after watching anime where your protagonist tends to faceplant themselves into the nearest pair of flesh mounds at every opportunity. As for the actual content itself, when the explicit acts happen in the story, they are either fully justified by the plot or serve to deepen the main romantic relationship. The acts themselves are very naturally built up to, and at least in so far as typical gay relationships are concerned. As a final note, what content is there is very vanilla, at least regarding the genre tags on this thing. I will mention there are no references to, um, knots in this novel. 
So take that as you will, blessed or cursed as it may be. First and last warning, I'm just putting this in to cover myself here, but as with all adult content, if it makes you extremely uncomfortable or you are not allowed to, please do not consume it. Or if you do decide to read this thing for the romance, well, then just skim over it if it's not your thing. Moving on. Choices and gameplay. 7 out of 10. This is the one part of the novel that's a bit lacking, but not unimportant or outright bad by any means. There are three different endings based off the choices you make. Two of these endings are very similar, but they alter enough that they completely change how you might interpret the story. For this reason, I'm giving it a 7 out of 10. Just to mention it here, in case you want to experience this novel yourself, there is one particular choice towards the end that will trigger the bad ending. You should be able to intuitively know what this choice is when you come across it in-game. That's all I want to say about it, because I don't want to spoil too much. And remember to save. I do need to mention that there is also a handful of choices that only affect the ending. A good rule to spot them is whether or not they take a political or philosophical tone. Um, if you receive any choice that is about, let's just say, fan service, I want you to know that it won't affect the ending. I thought that was obvious, but there was a person I talked to regarding this that was probably mean, so I'm going to mention it here just to be safe. With this knowledge to help you navigate your own potential playthrough, let's move on to overall ratings. Adastra, overall score, 9 out of 10. Adastra overall is a very interesting experience. The lore and backdrop of the game take place in a universe that is somewhat grounded in our real world. This leads us to a lot of interesting connections and implications for many of the characters and events. To top it all off, there are a lot of interesting inclusions for a romance visual novel. Having the backdrop of a sci-fi Roman empire lends itself naturally to political intrigue. What's interesting is what that intrigue leads into. Without spoiling too much here, there are themes of cosmic horror, agency, and religiosity that manage to weave themselves into the narrative seamlessly. Naturally, being a visual novel, there is of course plenty of romantic wholesomeness and fluff, pun intended, to go around. What makes Adastra a good overall experience is how these disparate elements manage to make you care about the characters, and arguably make you fall in love with one in particular. Okay, we are almost ready for the spoiler section, but I do have to answer one last question before we begin. Do I feel comfortable recommending this outside of its original demographic? I had to think about this one a lot, but I feel like my answer is of course going to be yes. I think it holds up well as just a romance story about aliens if that's what you want to read. The thing that actually pushed me towards this answer was my experience reading Stephen King's novel, It. I don't know if I should spoil a literal 35-year-old novel at this point, but I will just say that a few things the protagonists do as children in the book are... wild, to say the least. Despite that very uncomfortable moment, I would still recommend the novel as a horror story if that's what you want to read. I think the same logic can be applied here. As meme to death as the gay furry community is, it's still a good romance story if that's what you want to read. After all, it is a novel. You can skim. And what's in the novel is, well, at least a little less reprehensible than what happened in IT by some standards. I'm tempted to say reading Adastra might even give you a bit of perspective on the wants, needs, and relationships that occur within the gay community, especially coupled with my in-depth analysis. Now it's time for the spoiler section. So if you want to read this visual novel, go do it now. It's free, and it's worth it if you're just feeling like reading a good romance story. So go do it. I will be here when you get back. If you don't feel like you could ever read such a thing as a gay furry visual novel under any circumstances, or perhaps you've already read it, well, that's okay. 
get ready, because we are about to seriously dissect and summarize this narrative. Okay, so let's get into it. This narrative can be neatly divided into a three-act structure. Starting with the first act, we are introduced to you, aka the main character, and the primary love interest, Amicus. The main character is a 20-year-old college student who has come to Italy to study the Roman Empire. During the first night at your new apartment, you are visited by Amicus. After having a brief conversation, Amicus panics after realizing he's actually broken a huge galactic taboo by making first contact with Earth. In the resulting panic, he kidnaps you and takes you to Adastra. Because of the conflict on the ship, you can't return back to Earth. So Amicus makes the deal with you that if he becomes Emperor, you will get safe transport back to Earth. Most of this act is about introducing characters and introducing the setting, as well as the conflict between you and Amicus. As it turns out, Amicus went to Earth to find an exotic pet to increase his chances of becoming Emperor, and that is the role that you have found yourself in now. After the conflict on the ship, Amicus is actually reluctant to have you do anything that you don't want to do. We'll swing back around to some of the specifics of this later, but there's an important piece of lore to be revealed here that we really need to go over before we get into that. There are actually three levels of alien species. The parents are considered the highest, as they exist as basically the gods of the universe. Then there are the siblings, races that were first uplifted by the parents themselves. Finally, there are the children, who are, in turn, uplifted by the siblings. This will be important later for a few reasons, but remember the parents especially. So back to end of the first act stuff. We are introduced to several characters at this point. There is, of course, the main character in Amicus, but just opposing both of them are Cassius and Alexos. Cassius is the brother of Amicus and the one who is currently challenging Amicus to the throne. Alexos is, of course, his respective pet. I just want to mention it here, because maybe I've just been playing too much of the new Hyrule Warriors game lately, but whenever I read a scene with Cassius in it, I always imagine his voice to be the same as Rivali's voice actor. I mean, it's just asinine. Anyways, the enigmatic Kato is next. Kato is the former Emperor's advisor and current acting Emperor. We don't get a good read on Kato until later, but just keep him in mind. The final two characters introduced here are Virginia and Neferu. Virginia is the aspiring Emperor's advisor, and the political savvy sister of the two wolf brothers competing for the throne. Neferu is the suave and seductive diplomat from another race of Egyptian-inspired furry jackals known as the Chemians. His main goal here is to try to secure an alliance with the wolves. Now, with all the players on the board, we are almost ready for the inciting incident. We get a few character moments with Amicus and Alexos, eventually culminating in a moment with Cato beating Amicus in a sparring match. This is important because it sets up the audience to hate Cato and highlights his character as a potential antagonist. A couple of the more fan y scenes with Amicus happen here, but we'll come back to those later in the analysis. Cato, being acting emperor, decides that the next emperor will be decided by a series of three trials. This gives us the inciting incident slash point of attack for our story. Amicus needs to be emperor, and in order to do that, he needs to win the trials. Predictably, there are three in total. The trial of the arts, the trial of rhetoric, and finally, the trial by combat. An important note here is that Cassius has almost zero chance of winning the combat trial, so in theory, Amicus only needs to win one trial to become Emperor. So with that, we are thrust into the second act. There are a few things here that are important to understand going forward. Mainly, we are brought to focus on the political stakes that each prospective Emperor will have if they get into power. 
Amicus will be a more outwardly focused ruler and a more progressive ruler focused on civil justice issues. Cassius, on the other hand, is planning a full regression of the Empire to traditional norms. Do a, um, make Adastra great again, perhaps? One good thing here to mention is Adastra is the only sibling civilization that still kind of has slavery. Amicus wants to do away with the whole indebted servant situation, while Cassius, of course, wants to keep it. Another thing Cassius wants to do is dissolve the Triumvirates, who are one of the few checks and balances on the Emperor's power. A little detail here is that the Triumvirates will be judging the performance of the prospective Emperors in the trial. We will come back to that at one point, eventually. To continue, we're given a lot of setup for the rest of the story. One of the most important components of this is actually a bit of Roman wolf culture that gets introduced to us. This is known as the Tragedy of Mira. You see, the first trial to decide the Emperor is actually the Trial of the Arts, and for part of this trial, the two competing candidates have to perform a little mock-up Tragedy of Mira with their respective pets. So let's look at Mira right now. The Tragedy of Mira tells of a young emperor who fell in love with a member of another species. This is all well and fine, but his lover falls ill, and the parents, remember them, give the emperor a choice. His lover or his empire. And of course, he is forced to choose the latter. After reading this, it's kind of hard not to notice the parallels being set up here. From this point onward, it feels like the specter of Mira hangs over the entire visual novel. This is made even worse by the real-world precedent set by the barrier gaze trope. If you don't know, I'll link a video by another content creator that goes more into the trope in depth. But here's a summary. Basically, America had this thing called the Haze Codes that meant you could never give gay characters a happy ending? Something about normalizing degeneracy and the like. That means in a lot of stories you will have gay characters die off for random and often unspecified reasons. If you want a recent example of this, just look up Destiel Gate. Link to another video on that in the description. Actually, it's kind of funny because both a character in Adastra and Supernatural are nicknamed Cass. And now I'm just imagining all the Destiel memes with Cassius instead. Oh god, if you're gonna make me remember Tumblr, at least link me remember the, um, good times. When there were other things on that hellscape of a website. At this point in the story, we are introduced to one of the main themes of the story. Can we trust the parents? I just kind of want to point out here that this is an oddly religious theme, especially odd when considered in the context of a literal gay furry visual novel. This religious framing can actually lend itself to a number of different readings of the text. We'll get more in depth about this when we talk about the endings. For now though, I just want you to keep in mind here that there are actually a few different answers to the question of, can we trust the parents? Your answer specifically to that question will actually form a lot of how you end up interpreting this visual novel. Moving back to plot things now, we get a scene where Neferu attempts to seduce Amicus. His affections are very clearly rebuffed, and this leads to a coming out scene. Yes, that type of coming out. Originally, I wasn't going to mention this scene, but it actually ends up being important for a few reasons. First and most obvious, it marks an important milestone in the main character and Amicus's relationship. No, they are not dating yet, but it does open up the possibility. Secondly, it reveals the semi-homophobic nature of a Dastrin society. I imagine this part is specifically based off the later years of the Roman Empire, but if there are any history buffs in the comments, do let me know. The homophobia has obvious connotations on what has the potential to be a high-profile Adastrian relationship, but surprisingly enough, it also has plot importance. More on that later. 
One thing that I do want to touch on here is how this scene might read to an audience that has no experience with gay relationships between men, while also managing to be rather genuine the gay experience. Towards the end of the scene, the main character actually suggests giving Amicus a carnal favor? If and only if they win the first trial, which is something that might feel really out of place to a non-gay audience. And so totally, this is how a lot of gay relationships start and progress between men. The male gender role, mixed with homophobia, often doesn't allow for relationships like this to take traditional pathways. Often it starts out as friends, moves to friends with benefits, and if it progresses beyond that, then, then, and only then, it becomes a full relationship. With the advent of dating apps and higher levels of acceptance, this is becoming a bit less common, but well, if you dare venture onto Grindr, then you'll find out what I'm talking about. My real point here is that this lends an air of authenticity to the scene. The first trial comes and goes, almost unexpectedly. Amicus, of course, loses. This pins a lot of the conflict and the stakes onto the next upcoming trial. The most important event here is that Cassius has an unexpected intrusion into Amicus's room for unknown reasons. This results in a little confrontation between the brothers, where Amicus ends up hurting Cassius. Which results in, of course, Cassius threatening to execute the main character if he becomes Emperor. At this point in the story, we are treated to the budding romantic relationship between our main characters. Amicus at one point asks the main character to date him, not understanding the full connotations of what dating means to humans. The main character rebuffs his affections in a very friendly manner as not to cause any rifts between them. Later on, they both share their first kiss, but the main character is still hung up on progressing the relationship. At this point, the main character is conflicted about whether or not he wants to commit to a relationship with Amicus. Now, it's literally one day before the trial, as the upcoming political event is looming over everyone. Eventually, we, as the main character, decide to confess our feelings to Amicus. So we get some flowers from the garden, steal our nerves before walking into Amicus's room to find... Amicus, entangled romantically with Neferu. Insert vague, gayified reference to Julius Caesar and Cleopatra here. Wait, didn't Caesar have illicit relations with a Macedonian king or something? Or am I misremembering my Roman history here? You know what? Screw Cleopatra. I want to hear about that love story. This scene, as you can imagine, is one of the high points for character drama, and it comes right around the middle of the novel. Of course, after seeing this, our main character immediately runs away. Amicus immediately follows after to try and... explain the situation? Our very emotionally hurt protagonist is, of course, not having any of it. This results in a night that our characters spend apart. The next morning is the second trial, and Neferu comes in to explain the situation to the main character. To summarize, Neferu made a deal with Amicus to protect the main character if Cass does in fact manage to become Emperor. Apparently, doing the do with Amicus was payment for such a deal. With the explanations over, Neferu and the main character go and make up with Amicus. Amicus has basically been crying his eyes out all night in the meditation room because he has felt guilty about what he did. The main character gives Amicus a bit of encouragement for his upcoming speech, and with that, Amicus and the main character make up and we move into the second trial. The trial of Rhetoric begins with Amicus speaking first. Amicus makes an excellent speech here, even going so far as to reference the tragedy of Mira in his speech. With his speech over, Cass takes the stage, and immediately things start to go south. First of all, Cass breaks several of the rules of the competition, referencing Amicus in his speech and going over time, but that's not even the worst part. At this point, we understand why Cassius was in Amicus's room. Cass plays a clip of Amicus and Neferu, 
having illicit relations for the whole of Adastra to see. This has several implications. For the homophobic Adastrian population, it means that the reputation of Amicus has basically been completely ruined. Secondly, it throws the entire idea of an alliance with the Chemians, aka Neferu's people, into question. This leads to an almost lost moment where it appears Cass has secured the Emperorship, and Neferu leads the main character out of the room in expectance of the worst. To everyone's surprise, however, the Triumvirates vote for Amicus. This is actually explained by the fact that somehow Cass's plan to dissolve the Triumvirates was leaked. This has even more political implications for the main character, partially because he happens to be one of the three people who could have leaked the information, and the other two happen to be Virginia and Alexos. I want to pause here for a moment to talk about the narrative structure thus far. One big thing we have here is a lot of simple setup and payoff. Individually, these don't make the story too hard to follow, but when they come together, we get a very interesting and intricate story. I can't count how many times already I've tried to shorten this summary and had to go back and add details so that later things would still make sense. The trick here is making enough of the details in your story relevant so that the reader has to pay attention. This even applies in moments that at first glance seem very minor. Of course, it is possible to overdo this and bog down your story, but I digress. Taking a look at the plot structure, we have our own little climax with the cheating scene that evolves into an all-is-lost moment leading to a resolution. If this was another story, the plot could actually end here, treating the rest of the novel as romantic fluff and or resolution. This is not that story, though, and we still have a ways to go before I can properly explain the endings. Hopefully, by the time we get there, I can explain why almost everyone who has read this thing has fallen in love with Amicus. Wait, if I fell in love with a furry wolf himbo, does that make me a furry? Furries? Or should I say... Hello, furries? Ugh, that's a strange thing to say. I have questions! When do I get my million dollars that I have to exclusively spend on art commissions and bag dragon dildos? Do I have to wear a fursuit? I mean, I just don't think it's my look, and they do seem to be uncomfortable. Well, technically all good cosplay is uncomfortable, but still. I still don't have a fursona, does that disqualify me? What would my fursona even be? I guess I've always liked D&D Dragonborns, but I don't know. Can Dragonborns have Viking aesthetics? Maybe a wolf boy or a werewolf since I fell in love with one? Ugh, I still don't quite know. I am also poor, does that disqualify me? I guess I did make a fur affinity account the other day, but that was to look for a specific piece of old art that I still haven't found. Plenty of non-furries do use that site. Hmm, I guess the last question here answers it for me. I can't be a furry if I'm too poor to pay for art commissions after all. So continuing where we left off. The second trial is finished, and Amicus is basically guaranteed the Emperorship now. The big drawback here is the political situation, as it is less than favorable for both our protagonists. Another potential issue is the first contact Amicus accidentally made with Earth. Oops, that little detail hasn't been addressed yet. Now Amicus is called to a meeting of the Triumvirates, and the main character is invited along to see the city of Adastra for the first time. What happens during the meeting is kind of unimportant, but what happens after is. After the meeting, our two lovebirds find their way to a restaurant for dinner. They have a long conversation and finally make the relationship official. So, there we go. Our little ship is poised and ready to sail off into the sunset, right? Right? This is a happy story, right? Well, no. Literally, right after the dinner, the main character dies. And not in a special way, too. He just catches the Adastrian equivalent of the common cold and dies. It's mentioned later that there isn't even a vaccine for whatever the main character catches because it's considered too mild. He just dies. Roll the end credits. Well, not really. 
Possibly the bigger issue here is for Amicus. The doctor who attempted to treat us found no profile. The proverbial first contact cat is out of the bag. We get a fever dream sequence where the main character listens in on the parents having a conversation about the woven species. Gods of the universe, remember them? One important tidbit that we catch is that the work of Mira must be completed. Oof, there's that little thing again. If alarm bells are not ringing in your head at this point, then I don't know how you managed to get this far into the story. And with that, our main character wakes up on a pile of flowers, as per a Dastrin funerary custom. Okay, so we wake up, having been presumed dead, but we only do so because of a divinely instated purpose? Sound like a... another well-known figure in the Western canon? A figure with ambiguous and argued over sexuality, no less? Maybe I'm really, really reading into this, but I'm just going to set the Jesus counter to one. Okay, new rule. I get one plant-based tangent per non-plant-based video. Let's talk about the flowers our protagonist wakes up in. So these happen to be lavender, which as you may know have a long history of cultivation and cultural uses in the broader Roman-influenced world. Lavendula, as it is scientifically classified, is a genus of 47 flowering plants native to Europe, with most species finding their homes in the Mediterranean. Lavender belongs to the mint family, which can be identified by its square stems and opposite leaves. The lavender you're probably familiar with is mostly Lavendula augustifolia, which is commonly known as English lavender. I think the lavender here has a much higher chance of being Lavendula stoaceus, which is also known as topped lavender or French lavender. While it may be called French lavender, it is still the most common species of lavender to be grown in Italy and is native to the region. Maybe I should mention that English lavender is also kind of ironically native to Italy as well. In this story, lavender is specifically associated with the character of Amicus. This takes the form of the scent of his cologne slash deodorant and the piling of lavender for the main character's funeral. Lavender in the language of flowers takes its meaning from its color. Purple has long been associated with royalty, luxury, and elegance. This is extra fitting for Amicus considering, well, he is royalty, but there's another meaning of lavender that plays specifically into this story. That is, devotion. It is arguable that a lot of this story is Amicus showing devotion for the main character in multiple ways. Well, except for the initial abduction bit, but we're going to talk about that later. I'm just going to take this down as Amicus's devotion being one of the possible reasons people fell in love with him so much. Overall, I'm going to give the use of Lavender in this novel 10 out of 10. Would do again. They also mention orchids in the scene right after this, but I'm probably going to have to do a whole video on the pop culture mythos of orchids before I can even think about talking about them again on this channel. So let's get back to the plot, shall we? The main character immediately makes his way back to Amicus, but not without first running into Alexios in the gardens. We find our wolf boy passed out, assumedly from drinking way too much, and... Space Xanax. Their wording, not mine. After a terrified moment of getting Amicus awake, they share an intimate and understandably emotional evening together. This is also where we are treated to our first real intimate romance scene with the two partners. It's not done in an awkward way, we get the emotional stuff out of the way first, but still, let's be honest, if you found out your intimate partner was back from the dead, you would cry a lot and hug them and such. And then you would screw the ever-living shit out of them. I see you over there. I know you're absolutely ravenous. And as a fellow worshipper of Slanesh, I cannot say that I don't support it. The next day, we are treated to a rude awakening, courtesy of Cato and Cass. By this point, they know Amicus made first contact, but Cato almost seems to be more upset over the lover's bit than anything. It's assumed at this point that Alexos is the one who informed the main character still being alive, and informed Cato of, well, the main character and Amicus's relationship. Cato uses this as an excuse to effectively nullify Amicus's upcoming emperorship. 
To do this, Cato stages the third trial with Cass as the victor. The main character makes a move to put a stop to the staging, and this results in a fight where Amicus pulls off Cato's visor. Our villain gets a little... mask off moment. Kind of ironic, even if it's a bit on the nose. <laughs> on the nose. The ensuing chaos results in Amicus being captured and imprisoned. The main character flees to Nefaru's room and narrowly avoids getting killed due to... diplomatic immunity. As it turns out, Nefaru actually kept up his end of the bargain with Amicus. Our main character is now officially a Chemian citizen. He can't leave the palace under threat of death, but at least he is safe for the moment. With that, we under entered into a bit of a calm before the storm period. Our protagonists are safe, albeit only on thin margins. This is where some stuff I'm going to gloss over, namely some moments with Cassius, as well as a few scenes of fluff with our protagonist visiting Amicus in the dungeons. Everyone now is work trying to get proof of the staged third trial, as well as any other information that might help dethrone Cass. Eventually, the key to doing that presents itself in the form of Alexos. As we expected, it turns out that Alex is a spy who has been playing different sides of this political conflict. Nefaru and the main character use this to blackmail Alex into giving them access to the archives. A quick detail here is that the archives are the main way in which the Emperor and the Empire is able to contact the parents. They also hold footage of the stage third trial, as well as other information that could get Amicus back on the throne. Our main character and Virginia go down to the archives to retrieve this information, as well as delete the main character's profile so he can relieve the palace without being killed. At this point, the parents decide to contact the main character. Here we are given a vision, one of blood and Amicus crying, as well as our final real choice of the novel. Will you submit to the benevolent will of the parents? And with that choice, we are ready for the climax. Keep in mind that this choice here has the most bearing on the three different endings of the novel. If you still haven't noticed it, it also has a lot to do with our theme. With the footage of the fake third trial and other forms of blackmail in tow, Virginia and the main character successfully convince Cass to abdicate the throne. Cass makes plans to announce his abdication the next day at a speech he was going to give. The next day comes and Cato calls everyone to breakfast. Hmm, suspicious. Everything seems ominously normal until Cass ends up being poisoned. Everyone rushes to give Cass medical attention, and Cato uses the poisoning as an excuse to lock the main character in Amicus's room for most of the day. After a few hours, the main character notices smoke rising from across the lake in Adastra City. This prompts an attempt to escape. After jumping off the balcony and making our way back into the palace, we find Alexos, who fills us in on what's happening. Cato has declared himself emperor and is planning on marrying Virginia and executing Neferu later that day. With Alex's help, the main character releases Amicus from the dungeons for a last resort option. Amicus now must challenge Cato to a fight to the death for the emperorship. Narrowly interrupting Nefer's execution, the fight for the throne ensues. After a short period, it becomes clear that Amicus is going to lose. At this point, the main character interrupts the fight by stabbing Cato with the knife that was meant for Neferu's execution. But this doesn't happen before Cato manages to mortally wound our protagonist. Cato is dead now, and Amicus is the rightful emperor. In dramatic fashion, you die for a second time in Amicus's arms. My grave is like to be my wedding bed. Juliet, Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. So finally, we are able to get on to the endings and the epilogue. Here, let's start with the bad ending. If you choose not to submit yourself to the parents, this is the end. You just die. From the insinuation of the parents in the scene, it seems that we might have a Romeo and Juliet situation here. The parents do say in the scene that they will have to find a new emperor. 
Um, hi, just a little editor's note here, um, before the heater kicks in and ruins this whole thing. I did get something a bit wrong with the bad ending. Um, it's actually referring to replacing the human rather than replacing the emperor. So there is a version of this bad ending that has Amicus as emperor. So just wanted to point that out. I still think my, um, my various interpretations of what could happen are valid. And I'm keeping my Romeo and Juliet reference. So, yeah. Bye. But we don't know exactly what happens to Amicus. Perhaps after all the attempting to ask the parents to bring the main character back, and failing no less, Amicus's faith is broken and he commits suicide. In the other endings, we know Cass did survive his poisoning attempt, so it is assumed that he becomes Emperor again here. This, of course, entails a lot of horrible political implications if Cass's beliefs haven't changed due to the sudden turn of events. Keep in mind that most of this is speculation, and the text itself doesn't give us much here. Perhaps I'm making it darker than it should be, and Amicus's nullified emperorship has more to do with his shattered faith than in, in the parents than anything else. I do think that managing to get a Romeo and Juliet reference in here was worth it, even if a later Twitter statement by the creators renders everything here wrong. After all, we do live in a post-JK Rowling world. Yikes. Moving past this point, we get on to the main two endings. Keep in mind here, in order to get either of these, you must have uh, submitted yourself to the benevolent will of the parents. Amicus is not about to lose the human he fell in love with, so he picks you up and merges you both into the archives at the same time to speak with the parents. In an emotional scene, the main character and Amicus are reunited in the metaphysical void of space. In the context of the narrative, this is the emotional climax of the story. It's also a very liminal moment. When reading this for the first time, we don't know what's going to happen. Have the parents just brought the main character back to give Amicus some final closure? Are they bringing you back to life? Or perhaps they're going to offer Amicus the same choice that Mira made. In this moment, we don't know. After the reunion, we continue the scene with the parents using the main character as a puppet mouthpiece to communicate with Amicus. This is one of the more deliberate moments of cosmic horror in the novel. We'll talk more about the reading of this story as cosmic horror later. The point is that this is not a particularly uplifting moment, and it doesn't give us a very benevolent impression of the parents either. The parents mention the main character has his own mission to carry out, and at the end of it all, Amicus is given the same choice we made. Will you submit yourself to the benevolent will of the parents? Amicus, of course, says yes, and both our protagonists wake up alive and well together in the archives. And here's where I officially set the Jesus counter to two you know what? If my channel ever gets big enough that I can have merchandise, I want a shirt with a drawing of me and Amicus on it, and I want it to say, I was double jesus so we all could marry Wolfmen. And you know what? It will be extra fitting. Because if I get that big and people find out that I reviewed a gay furry visual novel, let alone defended it, well, I will be justly crucified. And you know what? That's fine. I might as well go out in the fashion. Please, at least make sure that my crown of thorns is in full bloom. You know, hawthorn, maybe some roses, silver cross, gold spear, sapphires, emeralds, the works. Actually, just stick to roses. Hawthorn flowers can sometimes smell bad, as much as I do love them. Anyways, moving on, here we begin entering the epilogue. Amicus and the main character settle back into life in the palace. Amicus taking the throne is, of course, a big part of this. The full extent of the main character's mission is divulged here. The main character will return to Earth after nine more months on Adastra. He will stay there for eight years as he helps the human race reintegrate into larger galactic society. 
In addition, we get a bit of lore here. Supposedly, the parents are fighting against a cosmic horror like entity simply called the Other. We will come back to this at some point later, but let's go through some of the quick plot points. Amicus plans a nice day for him and the main character. Amicus's date plans get cancelled because of a meeting involving the impending alliance with Kemia. To make up for their lost day, you and Amicus have a nice nighttime picnic on the island. This is where Amicus proposes marriage. After you accept the proposal, we get our last intimate romance scene of the novel. Time passes and we get goodbye scenes for all the characters. To give us a sense of time, it is mentioned that it has been a whole year since Amicus and the protagonist made up before the second trial. During the final night we have on Adastra, we find ourselves unable to sleep and drawn to the archives. And here is where our endings diverge. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Ephesians 2, 8. First things first, let's cover the quote-unquote good ending. Here the main character is shown a vision of the supposed future by the parents. In this vision, the main character returns to Adastra eight years later with his mission accomplished. He marries Amicus, and together they tour the galaxy and live out roughly 300 years of a happily ever after. Afterwards, they both die and join the parents. Together forever, like all good romantic endings. In truth, we are not quite at the very, very end yet. But first, we have to talk about the other vision that might be shown to you. That is not dead that can eternal lie, and with strange eons, even death may die. H.P. Lovecraft, Call of Cthulhu. Here we have an alternative vision. In this one, we get to see none other than the fabled lady known as Mira herself. For a moment, it seems like she is here to give us an important message, or perhaps even tips for dealing with the parents, or at least a damning secret about them. As the conversation progresses, we realize something is very, very wrong. Eventually, Mira reveals herself to be a personification of the other. In one sense, explaining her tragedy, and in another, showing us a not-so-hopeful glimpse of the future. In her words, suffering with our wolf for all eternity. Some could say that this is confirmation of the parent's benevolence, but I take this a bit differently. This, in essence, is the horror of Lovecraft. On one hand, you can submit yourself to the nihilistic worldview of science, here as represented by the other. In this view, the universe is cold and uncaring, perhaps even antithetical to life in its natural state. There is no meaning, and under this revelation, the oblivion of death is perhaps preferable to an understanding of the void. On the other hand, you can submit yourself to religion, as represented here by the parents. But just so you know, by Lovecraft standards, this might not be preferable either. In this view, you have given up your agency to being so powerful and so ancient that any attempt to understand their motives would surely be an invitation into madness. Here is the crazy thing, though. Perhaps the interpretation of the story as cosmic horror and the interpretation as religious faith can coexist without conflicting. Both religion and science have evolved a lot in the time since Lovecraft was writing. In a lot of countries, organized religion is growing more and more out of fashion. At the same time, there's been a significant uptick in the interest of more eclectic religious practice, like spirituality or mysticism. One look at the astrology and tarot communities on YouTube is a quick confirmation of this. It's not the popular thing anymore to submit yourself to all-consuming deities. Rather, the line is finding your own meaning in the various practices, taking what you need and leaving the rest. Science has changed as well since Lovecraft's time. 
There are new theories that could lead one to a more hopeful interpretation of the universe. We have multi-world theory, as presented by quantum mechanics. This means even if the life you currently live is filled with suffering, there is still a version of you out there somewhere that is experiencing your own personalized happy ending. Some people go as far as to say this interpretation of quantum mechanics explains what happens after you die. In this view, you just go to another version of yourself in a different universe. In a more esoteric route, you could perhaps use theories like relativity to defend philosophies like presentism. I'll link a song that actually explains the entire philosophy of presentism in a nutshell down in the description. There are even more things that science could potentially give you hope for in the present day, whether it be space travel, the curing of most diseases through gene therapy. As much of a dumpster fire as our world is, there are still a lot of things to look forward to, and we just have a little bit of the novel left to cover, so let's get back to that. The vision's over, we say our final, final goodbyes to everyone as a group before getting onto the spaceship with Amicus. The ride home is diametrically opposed to the ride to Adastra, being peaceful and filled with fluff as our lovers spend their last few moments together. Finally, we are returned to the apartment where our main character was abducted in the first place. This is where we have reached the true ending of the novel. In a very on-the-nose but effective move, we as the audience are asked to say goodbye to Amicus as the main character says goodbye to him. This is why I think Amicus has been such an affecting character for most of the people who have read this novel. After all, they say the most effective way to know you care about something is to lose it. Like I said before, Mira seems to almost haunt this entire novel, and even here, we feel her presence. I feel like I have partly glossed over how much of an emotional roller coaster this novel is, and if I have to give any scene the way it deserves, it's this one. Both our protagonists are here, and they're trying to be strong for each other. Make the parting as easy as possible. But this is the truth. No parting with someone who means a lot to you is ever easy. They both play it as so casual, and when there's nothing left to distract them, they both break down. And the tears here are necessary. In a lot of ways, this is extremely genuine. It's not uncommon to avoid the uncomfortable emotions of a big change like this, but when it really matters, those emotions will end up spilling out in one way or another. So now let's get on to the interpretations of the ending. Depending on what vision you received and your life experience, this is where interpretations diverge. And yes, I know the creators have a Twitter, and there's a sequel in development, and there is Reddit, and you get to romance no Feyru in the sequel, but let's just let's just go through the interpretations as where they stand in the novel itself. If you've received the first vision, or perhaps you are a more religiously minded person, this goodbye is temporary. This is the happy ending. Humanity will be brought in line with galactic society, and eight years later you will be reunited with your wolf. Forever. This could be called the religious interpretation. If you receive the second vision, however, or you are not so religiously inclined, this goodbye could very well be permanent. You are tied to the will of unknowable gods that may or may not have your best interests at heart. Cosmic horror in a nutshell. In this variation of the ending, it even mentions that the main nations opposing Earth's galactic integration will be America, Russia, and China. Which, if you know anything about politics, would be very true. In that situation, I can only imagine you would need the help of the gods of the universe if you wanted to pull that off. Political remarks aside, this is where I have to talk a bit about my own personal relationship to the ending, as well as our proposed middle ground interpretation. So my first playthrough of this game, I actually got the quote unquote good ending. This wasn't because of my trust in the parents per se, but because of my own personal and political philosophy. I did not trust the parents at all due to my own personal relationship to religion. Despite getting the 
good ending, I really clung to the cosmic horror interpretation, especially when I went for the other two endings in subsequent playthroughs. In all honesty, this left me heartbroken for several days. I cried myself to sleep over this. I really thought this was ultimately a tragedy of a story. But the more time I've spent with this novel, the more I've moved away from the cosmic horror interpretation. Not because I've embraced the religious interpretation, but rather because of, well, multiple factors. Part of me realized that I was almost scared of reading this as a happy ending. Being a member of the LGBT community in a conservative rural area for all my life has ground into me that things like this, a happy future outside of the straight paradigm, shouldn't be possible. More specifically, I think I underestimated just how much I read myself into the main character. Specifically, I had to come to terms with the fact that a happy ending, at least in the romantic sense, could happen for me. When I read this, I was paranoid that the good ending just wasn't true. At least it felt like it couldn't be true. At the same time, I feel like I can't really ignore the theming present in the Cosmic War interpretation. When I read this scene now, I like to read it as the future is uncertain. After all, it's said that even the parents can't always predict the future. I treat the goodbye with Amicus almost as if it were a goodbye with someone in real life. Though we may promise to see each other again, nothing is certain. This, in fact, could be the last time I see you, regardless of how long our parting happens to be. Even so, I want you to know that this isn't the end. I'll carry you with me in little ways, in memories, in feelings, in dreams. The future can hold many things, happiness and tragedy, but we are both strong enough to make it through. And even if we aren't, whether death is infinity or oblivion, a little piece of my heart will always belong. To you. <sighs> Maybe I lied at the beginning. There might be some 2020 angst affecting my feelings on reading this thing. Maybe all of our interpretations are wrong. Maybe rather than cosmic horror, it's actually cosmic BDSM. Adastra, for submissives. Actually, if you take that route, then the meager ending is just the bratty ending, and the good one is the good boy ending. You know, that's actually a very dumb move by the parents, making you do things for them and then trapping you into your wildest fantasy afterward. Have we gotten off track? I think we have. There's still a few more things I wanted to talk about before we wrap things up, but don't worry. We are in the home stretch now. I want to talk about how this novel uses tropes, or well, really one trope in particular. Romance as a genre tends to be built off tropes more than any other, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. One trope this story is built off is, well, a tale as old as time. Think Beauty and the Beast, or maybe the Terminator here. Yes, we are talking about abduction as romance. A trope that admittedly gets a deserving bad rap. I mean, after all, Stephen King's book Misery is basically everything in this trope, but played as horror. I guess it's a good thing thing about this trope is that it does get your plot up and running very quickly. On the other hand, it can have toxic implications for your characters, especially if the kidnapper and the main romantic interest happen to be the same person, aka Amicus in the case of Adastra. Even despite that, I feel like it writes around some of the more toxic aspects of this trope rather well, so let's go over those. A 
Abductionist romance often treats the abductor as perfectly morally justified or even heroic in their actions. This is considered toxic for the reason that it normalizes or even defies non-acceptable behavior. Often the justification is due to the extenuating circumstances of the plot. As such, these plots usually have a moment of humanization for the abductor, usually by showing us a small act of mercy to the kidnapped party. This moment of humanization actually comes twice for Amicus. First, we get a more traditional version of this moment, where Amicus gives the main character food after he wakes up on the spaceship. The second moment, though, really throws this entire trope on its head. In this moment, we have a bested Amicus, although our disastrous attempts to steer the ship back to Earth have ended up with us potentially stranded out in space. Here we get a literal admission of guilt. Amicus screwed up in his estimations of humanity. He was blatantly wrong to kidnap the human from Earth. This version of a humanizing moment is a literal moment of shame. A moment of shame as admitted by the character who did the abduction himself. Of course, this is also a bit of a well-placed lore dump, and the extenuating circumstances do still lead our characters to Adastra, but that's how these plots work. And that's not the only way in which this novel morally critiques Amicus's actions at the beginning. One thing this novel does is remind us of the first contact thing to build suspense. Reminders of first contact by extension remind us of the whole trip to Adastra. Some of Amicus's dialogue at these points in the stories imply that Amicus still feels bad about the whole situation. Canonically, these moments are weeks if not months after the initial abduction. These implications are proved to be true after the climax of the story. Right after the main character is revived for a second time, Amicus outright apologizes for everything. Just let that sink in for a moment. It has just been revealed to Amicus that the abduction was part of the parents' plan all along. Even after that, he still states that the whole situation was wrong in the first place. This story gives the abduction the literal biggest justification possible. The justification of the literal benevolent gods of the universe, and our abductor still rejects it. If that isn't revealing of Amicus's moral compass, then I don't know what is. To conclude, yes, Amicus's actions do get justified by the plot, but he himself completely rejects that justification, and rightfully so. This makes the story a minimum self-aware and at maximum self-critiquing. Number two, abductionist romance often rewards the abductor with love, even despite their horrible actions towards the love interest. This is where a lot of people often talk about things like Stockholm Syndrome and or emotional manipulation. I have no other way place to put it, so I'll talk about the health of the primary romantic relationship in this section too. Now this one could be debatable, but I don't think Amicus is quote unquote rewarded with love in this story. Actually going back to the indifferent interpretations of the ending, there could be an argument that Amicus is actually being punished by having his love taken away from him. Cosmic horror, single-handedly making toxic elements of your story more overlookable since 1928. In all seriousness though, the main character potentially has eight years to think this whole relationship over. If he decided he doesn't want to continue it, well, I can't say I don't support him. Beyond the cosmic horror interpretation, it by and large feel like Amicus earns our love. The main character here actually sets the pace of the relationship. He notices all the red flags and is very hesitant to date Amicus up until the second half of the novel. Amicus in turn is very careful about asking the main character consent before doing anything, and the one time he doesn't ask for consent it causes issues, aka the Neferu incident. This is why I mentioned that the fanservice scenes were more consensual than most. I don't want to go too in-depth on fan service, so I'll just say that the massage scene was a great example. Amicus' guilt at kidnapping the main character is brought up so much that by the time we get to the point in the novel where the relationship is official, we've 
basically already forgiven him for it. In fact, it's arguable that he agonizes over the whole incident more than we do in the end. It's hard to explain if you haven't read the novel, but watching Amicus perform these little acts of devotion over and over again, it becomes hard almost not to fall in love with him. It really gives me the feeling that even if we had completely rebuffed his affections, he would still have taken the time to help us be safe and get home to Earth. Let's move on to relationship health. If we are going to look at this relationship from an emotional manipulation perspective, there are some things there, but I don't think they are ultimately that bad at the end, at least if you exclude the meddling of the parents. By the midpoint of our story, our main character isn't particularly dependent on Amicus anymore. If anything, he's more dependent on Neferu than anyone. Proper emotional manipulation is ultimately dependent on isolation, and I think this point is refuted by the robust social relationships that the main character has with the entire cast. Kato is the villain, so there isn't much to say about him. Moving on, the main character develops a very supportive relationship with Alexis during the beginning of the novel. This is one that goes downhill over time, of course, due to the whole spying. Thing. One of the main character's best friends by the end of the novel is actually Neferu, kind of surprising when considering the whole incident with Amicus. In a more toxic version of this relationship, that might actually end up being a sore spot between Amicus and the main character. To further drive home Amicus's non-controlling nature, we share an intimate goodbye with Neferu as we are leaving into Dastra. This happens in front of Amicus, no less, and he doesn't mind. Continuing on, Virginia is an ally to the main character, and a supporter of the main character, even though she's more emotionally detached than the other characters. We even grow to have a bit of a friendship with Cass, of all people. I did mostly gloss over those scenes in the narrative section, though. There's a good little piece of life advice here. If and or when you move to a new area, make friends with people. Social connections are good in general, but this way if you find yourself in a relationship, you can ask other people for feedback. Maybe even find more about your partner and how they interact with their friends. Now I can already preempt an argument here. What about Belle? She was friends with the other characters in the story, does that make Beauty and the Beast less bad? I guess I'm kind of stuck comparing this story to Beauty and the Beast at this point. Kind of ironic considering this story could be either beautiful or beastly, depending on where your tastes lie. The answer to the previous question here is no, not really. You see, the difference here is really the intent motivating the characters in both instances. Beauty and the Beast the other characters have a motive to keep Belle there and encourage romance with the Beast. In that story, if the last petal falls, the characters just become candelabras and cutlery forever. Here the characters have varying motives, but the safety of the main character is actually a prime concern. So much so that at one point Amicus suggests that Neferu should arrange for your safe transport back to Earth, or at least at the bare minimum, Kemia. In this instance, it is the main character who chooses to stay. This kind of moment isn't uncommon for abduction as romance stories, but due to our access to the main character's inner world, it really does feel like he's staying of his own volition. To end this section, I even did a little research on the psychology of good relationships for the video. On screen now is a list of positive and negative interactions between Amicus and the main character. The story actually falls into John Gottman's golden ratio for relationships, in which there should be around five positive interactions to every negative one. Although, if this isn't enough to convince you, fine, I guess. My point here is that this relationship is at least more aspirational than the vast majority of abductionist romance stories. And finally, we have number three. The transformative power of love. Think of when the beast, when he transforms at the end of the movie. This obviously isn't a thing in this story because the intended audience is furries. Case closed. In all seriousness, though, there's a bit to talk about here. 
This trope is seen as toxic because of how it encourages bad relationships to continue rather than end. Another commonly brought up issue is the fact that the change of character presented is almost instant. Rather than taking years of dedication and therapy like it does in the real world, at the same time, the transformative power of love is actually absent, mostly, from a death struck. For confirmation of my last statement, we need to look at Amicus's character arc as a whole. Amicus's character arc mostly revolves around him learning to respect human culture and the main character's boundaries. It also, to some extent, involves Amicus learning to deal with the pride and entitlement that being a prospective emperor might engender in anyone. By the end of the novel, we can see he's better at dealing with these things, but at the same time he is at no way transformed. Towards the end of the novel, Amicus plans a date for the main character and gets interrupted by a meeting regarding the Chemian Alliance. Both our protagonists show up about five hours late to the restaurant, and Amicus shows a lot of entitlement when the restaurant can't then honor his reservation. The important detail here is that the restaurant was actually going to serve human food on that day. This shows that Amicus is attempting to understand and respect human culture, even though he still has a lot to deal with regarding his own negative attributes. In large part, he's still the same impulsive himbo he was at the start of the novel, but at least now he and the main character are on more or less even footing. To fully bookend this section, I would like to have a little discussion about how gender and sexuality influence the abduction as romance trope. I think it's only appropriate considering the fact that we live in a post-Beauty and the Beast castrab remake era whatever that thing was. Plenty of people in our day and age have made think pieces about this trope and how toxic it can be. One notable characteristic of these stories that I haven't touched on yet is the fact that it's usually the male protagonist that kidnaps the female one. In fact, versions of the story where the male is kidnapped instead are often played as horror. Again, see Stephen King's novel Misery. The interesting thing is that Adastra uses this trope in a queer setting, though this may in fact change how the story is written in several regards. Partially, I think this makes it so that the main character has more agency than is typical due to the male gender role. For example of this, see the stage trial, the climax, and the initial abduction. The agency of the abducted, however, doesn't automatically fix this trope. This is something with legitimate criticisms of a number of quote-unquote strong female characters can attest. I feel in the case of Adastra that this trope is rehabilitated to some extent by the various aspects of the story, but I also understand that this trope can be problematic and why people call for its retirement. I admit perhaps that the primary audience of this novel might have a bit of a blind spot in this regard. After all, this novel plays a bit into the queer fantasy. Most members of the LBGT plus community feel alienated in some regard. The statement can be extra true in the often memed subset of furries that exist among them. While not universally a gay thing by any means, part of the story plays on the fantasy of being whisked away to a place where maybe you aren't completely validated, but at least you feel like you belong. Maybe I'm completely wrong, and this story and its relationships are really toxic. I mean, there is really nothing wrong with people who enjoy stories like Beauty and the Beast, or even Twilight for that matter. Problematic faves or whatever. The real point here is, at least my Twilight has gay space wolves. <laughs> Oh my god, I think we found another t-shirt, Shalogan people. Same design as the first. With that little trope talk out of the way, I have one final thing that I wanted to talk about before we wrap up. It's something that actually often gets pretty overlooked in visual novels. The music. Now, the music on this, as far as I can tell, is public domain royalty-free music par for the course as visual novels go. Despite not being an original composition, there is one track that I think is used very well. 
The song is entitled Second Thoughts by General Fuzz, and we hear two different versions of it in the visual novel. The song, as you can hopefully hear right now, is very simple, being built on only a F major 7 chord. The interest in the song comes from the various syncopated parts that drift in and out. The major 7 chord in particular is interesting because it has an association with the works of Debussy and his dreamy impressionist style. So, we already have the setup for a calm atmosphere in the music itself, and to top it off, this track is typically played during time skips and other explicitly happy moments. When the second version of this song is played, it's literally during the happiness moment in the whole novel, the vision during the good ending. In this version, we have even more layers and a high violin part, as if to make us feel as though we are truly sailing off into the sunset with Amicus. I couldn't think of a better way to end this novel. I guess we should have like a TLDR or conclusion to bookend this whole thing. So to summarize, Adastra is a novel with an intricate and emotionally loaded whirlwind of a plot. Amicus is a very good boy, and by the end, we've all fallen in love with him. The ending itself leaves us with multiple interpretations of the future of the couple. This means that even after all that, we don't even know if we actually end up with our wolf boy or not. This is heightened by the monumental diplomatic tasks that has been entrusted to us. If you are the kind of person who has faith in anything in this case, be it the future or a higher power, then the anime amicus ship is a done deal. You get yourself a happy ending, and... well, yeah. However, if you don't have faith, then the fate of the couple is much more dubious, potentially skewing the story from romance to cosmic horror. And so, there we have it. We have come to the ending of this video. And you know what? I think I figured out something about myself. Like I said at the beginning, I am still not a furry. But I do pine for wolf boys when I'm sad. I remember having this crush on Twilight Princess Link when I was a teenager. Oh, and I did marry Farkas when I played Skyrim. I still marry him whenever I play Skyrim. And of course, I'm Team Jacob as far as the modern Twilight revival is concerned. This is not me being a furry. Wolves are the animal of Odin. I have plenty of Nordic ancestry in me. I am not sad. I am yearning for the embrace of the Allfather. Is it wrong to yearn for the embrace of the Allfather? Isn't that so much more epic to say than I have romantic angst today? <sighs> Who am I kidding? Maybe I won't buy a ticket to FurCon. But I will have to fork over $50 for that amicus plushie eventually. I guess if there is one thing I wanted to say in this video, it was... I love you, amicus. So that's it. Everyone get out. Get out before I cry over a virtual wolf boy again. I guess I didn't give 2020 enough credit before. It really did shut down the dating scene for, well, everyone. I guess the sentiment that we could never find a boy as good as Amicus was a bit stronger than I thought. Also, I have downloaded, but haven't yet read, the other two visual novels from the creators of Adastra. Make sure to like, comment, and whatever, and if this video does well, maybe I'll get around to reviewing the other two novels eventually. I think I'm going to start with The Smoke Room because it's the prequel, but I don't know yet. Give me advice in the comments. It may be a while though, and I do think I might make another plant-based video before I get around to that. My social links, as always, are in the description if you would like to peruse them. Twitter, Insta, Discord, Patreon, Twitch, although I rarely do stream anymore. And I guess for this video, I will leave you with the second thoughts reprise. Fare thee well, and may your dreams be filled with wolf husbandos. <laughs>